Welcome to Shannon's Club TV, the program that gives you the opportunity to relive the road and race histories of significant cars in Australia and connect with other enthusiasts. In each episode, we take a closer look at our feature car with selected archival photographs and enjoy a road test in an owner's example. And if you're in the market, we'll bring you some handy tips from the Shannon's auction team. Right now though, let's take a look at the coupe that took Mitsubishi into Porsche territory in one leap, the Starion. The Mitsubishi Starion was a welcome addition to a stellar 1980s lineup of powerful and fun rear drive coupes that had almost become extinct by the late 1970s. Its rivals would soon include new versions of the Mazda RX-7, Nissan 300ZX, Alfa Romeo GTV6 and the Toyota Supra. The Star N was a stealth showcase for Mitsubishi's growing expertise in turbocharging and chassis development. As a 2 plus 2 luxury coupe, it was more practical and easier to live with than most. Yet on its May 1982 release, its balance of economy, performance, comfort and refinement over all roads was challenged only by the Porsche 944 marked the 1982 arrival of a sports coupe mm. that could almost match the Porsche 944 at two thirds the price, must have created a real stir in Australian racing circles. Oh, it sure did. I mean, this was a car that had all the credentials to be a top series production race car. The only problem was it wasn't eligible. It took a key rule change a couple of years later for that to happen, and I'll get to that a little later too. The local Starion's two litre single overhead cam Sirius engine featured fuel injection and a tiny Mitsubishi Turbo, a first for a vehicle in this class. It had already been proven in the rear drive Lancer Turbo, a formidable rally weapon and early foundation for the Lancer Evo heritage. The Starion's front and rear strut suspension geometry was also a standout feature. The Starion's independent rear suspension featured struts and A-arms, similar to those found under a Lotus rear end. Four-wheel ventilated disc brakes were as good as you could get at the time. The Starion was steadily refined during its short stay on the Australian market. A new water-cooled turbocharger and upgraded fuel injection system in 1985 made the revised JB series a more consistent performer on and off the track. The Starion's real enemy proved to be its enforced diet from 1986, Australia's low-grade unleaded fuel. Despite the JD Starion's new intercooler, the huge drop in the new fuel's octane levels could not sustain the Starion's earlier power and torque outputs. Both took a dive at a time when rivals were switching to bigger engines. Mitsubishi quietly withdrew the Starion in 1987. Its job was done as Australian buyers turned their attention to Mitsubishi's bold new local and imported range of passenger cars and four-wheel drives. Mark, the Starion proved more successful on Australian racetracks mm. than anyone could have imagined, including Mitsubishi, I suspect. Oh, for sure. It was an absolutely outstanding race car in series production, and it had largely to do with a turbocharged engine. The Starion's chapter in Australian motorsport history, when it competed in both Group E series production and Group A touring cars in the 1980s, is a tale of mixed fortunes. Although the Starion was released in 1982, it wasn't until two years later that it made its debut in the local showroom stock Group E class, following a key rule change that allowed turbocharged cars to compete. Despite endless accusations of illegal turbo boost levels, the JA Starion instantly became the dominant force in Group E, thanks largely to its powerful turbocharged 2-litre engine, which more than compensated for the Japanese coupe's relatively high curb weight. During the next three seasons, the latest JB model became a popular choice for Group E competitors. But the Starion's winning streak came to an abrupt end with the arrival of the JD unleaded version in late 1985, which had to be raced in 1988. The JD's smaller turbocharger was the kiss of death for the Starion, in a racing class that had become hopelessly addicted to turbocharged power. Joe, despite its many attributes, the Starion was not a huge seller when it first went on sale here in 1982. So do you think its racing success has translated to increased traffic in the showroom? Well, normally it would, but we, mm. we went through a very turbulent period in this country at that time. Mm. We had fringe benefits tax coming in, we had high interest rates, the dollar was floated mm. and the yen was overheating and the impact on the pricing of that sort of car mm. was dramatic and I think 
it, it was a real success story that the Sarian did not disappear faster than it did. I think the fact that it hung around till 1987 was a real product of this motor racing profile. And I think without it, it would have just disappeared. Mm, yeah. In stark contrast to its success in series production, the Starian's short career in local Group A touring car racing was a disappointment. It all looked promising at the start, with the vastly experienced Kevin Bartlett appointed to head up the Australian arm of Mitsubishi's Rally Art Motorsport division in 1984. Unfortunately, the Starian Group A campaign was plagued by development issues with the more highly developed version of the 2-litre turbo and delays in homologation of vital racing hardware needed to succeed. Mechanical failures and growing corporate unrest led to the program being shut down after its first full season in 1985. Mitsubishi clearly did not have the resources or the willingness to persevere with trying to make the Starion a winning Group A touring car, as its corporate energies were focused more on world championship rallying and big cross-country events like the Paris-Dakar rally, in which it would enjoy enormous success in the years to come. The Australian Group A Starion team was later revived, albeit with a much lower profile, competing mostly throughout Southeast Asia, with the best Australian result being fifth place at Bathurst in 1987. Even so, given its phenomenal success in series production racing, one can't help thinking what a formidable Group A touring car the Starion could also have been had Mitsubishi backed it with the same all-out commitment it showed in world rallying. We hope you're enjoying Shannon's Club TV. Why not join the Shannon's Club where you can take part in our forums, get the latest exclusive offers and so much more. You'll find the full road and race histories of our feature cars along with previous episodes of Shannon's Club TV. Our names are Fred and Lynn Bellamy. We bought the car, which is a Mitsubishi Starion, in 1987, and uh, it's been Lynn's everyday drive ever since. It's been a marvellous little car. It's had very, very little done to it. Serviced every 10,000 kilometres, doesn't burn any oil, wouldn't hesitate to get in it and go to Queensland. It rides no different than when we picked it up out of the showroom. And it is a credit to Lynn that she's never, never had a dent in it, never been booked in it either. <laughs> <laughs> this is the very last, the JD model, and it's the intercooled turbo. The, one, the models before didn't have the intercooler on them. It's quite quick if you use the turbo, it, it gets going, but I don't know that Lynn's ever had the turbo kick in yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, what the turbo sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> We came out one day and there was an Alsatian dog sitting on the roof. I'd done a silly thing, I ran and yelled at him instead of coaching him off and he stood up and dug all his claws into the roof and then done the bonnet over so it has had the roof and bonnet painted. 26 years old, still reliable, always been reliable and really doesn't drive much different no. than any modern new car does now. It's firm in the suspension, it's a sports car suspension, but it's still a beautiful little car to drive. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon, joins us. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hi, Mark. Enjoy. Hi, Chris. The Starion, <coughs> a car that's sitting below the radar for the moment. There mm. seems to be a, a, a strong following that's not quite visible, yet we sort of know that it's there. What's happening with the Starion? I think, as you point out, it's probably more in a club scene right now. Um, it's an interesting 80s, you know, the 80s mm. wedge shape uh, Starion. Uh, I mean, we haven't seen too much of it in recent times, but I, it, it will come out. I think it's, uh, it's one of those interesting cars. And there's some very nice examples out mm. there because they tended to be bought by older buyers who really took pride in them and they're getting to the age where they're starting to sell them and they're nice original cars. And so would it be a good car to, to get into the market? Well, I think it's probably a very affordable car and probably would suit also that JDM scene that we've seen emerging in recent years. So yeah, look, probably a good buy. Uh, two litre turbo car, so it's, it's got some uh, good perspective. Yeah. And in, in terms of speculating on cars, I mean, this car had a, a tremendous racetrack history in the 80s, winning series production races, you know, so many of them. 
When you look at the future investment potential for a car, the ones that have done really well are the ones that had good competition histories. So that could be a big factor in the starring in years to come. It could be. So mm. look, I think it's a, it could be that emerging classic that we quite haven't seen that happen mm. yet. But it, again, the club scene has realised it. But um, yeah, I think watch the space. And it's also mm. got a very good formula, you know, two litre four cylinder motor turbocharged, which is virtually the way modern cars are going. So mm. it's, it, it was already there at some level. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Look, it was probably the early turbos that we saw here in Australia. So um, it, there's a lot of scope in probably developing that today with the technology that we have. It's true. Yeah. And are you finding like the Japanese car scene generally, there's this growing interest, growing enthusiasm for Japanese stuff? Yes, we are seeing that. I think the last few years have proved that. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, even the, uh, the AE86 uh, imports have come yeah. in. Uh, a real big, strong following with the JDM scene here mm -hmm. in Australia, but also we've seen it happen in Europe and in Japan as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, we're seeing this generation really coming into it. And we're also seeing some of the wide body Starian or Starian coming in that weren't sold here originally. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a small number of those coming in as well. Yep, it's a pity we missed out on those cars. They really, <laughs> they look, pretty really good. look the part, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris. And keep in mind, you can keep up to date on all the latest Shannon's auction news on the Shannon's Club website. If you like the competition images of the Mitsubishi Starion on the show today, you can find them all at autopix.com.au, Australia's largest motorsport photo archive. Well, Joe, in wrapping up, I guess, you know, all through this show, I've been calling it the Starion. You've been calling it the Starion. The $50,000 question, what's correct? Well, when the car was released, Mitsubishi was absolutely emphatic mm. that it was a combination of Star and Orion. Starion. Starion, right. However, <laughs> it was advertised with images of Stallions. Yes. And I think it's all got too hard over the years and people just accept that it's the Japanese pronunciation of stallion, <laughs> as in starion. And I think that's the way it's going to stay. Yeah, each to their own. Well, whether it's called starion or starion, we hope you've enjoyed this nostalgic look at this fabulous Mitsubishi Coupe. And we look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV.